Amen. I feel like it's preaching time. Amen. We would normally take up an offering right here, but we're going to preach. Now, we'll take the offering up before you get out of here, so don't leave early. I feel like God wants me to preach. Turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, please, chapter number 12. Mark, chapter number 12. We had a great time up in Lancaster for our romantic escape. Romantic escape. We escaped the hustle and bustle of the city. Had a little bit of romance. We call it romantic escape. We left after church Wednesday night. I said I wouldn't preach long, and then I preached probably close to an hour. I always do that. If I ever say I'm not preaching long, that's your cue that it's probably going to be a long message. Got up to Pennsylvania later on Wednesday night. Woke up early Thursday morning. Started working on this message. <clears throat> you have to strike when the iron's hot. And when God gives it to you, you better get up and write it down or you'll forget it. And uh, I had every intention of sleeping in Thursday morning, but about 6 o'clock I started working on this. And this thing has just really, really convicted me. <clears throat> and um, it's been on my heart. And I don't even have an outline this morning. I've got some Bible, but I don't have an outline. This is another one of them. You'll have to come back tonight to hear the rest of it messages. Two parts. Two parts. This is the appetizer tonight. It's the main entree. Appetizer. I'm about to choke on the appetizer, just to be honest with you. When I read our text, Mark chapter 12, stand with me, please. We'll see how far we get into this thing. This morning, I appreciate. I appreciate the presence of God that I feel. <clears throat> I've been to churches before and I didn't feel like I was at church. I felt like I was at a funeral or a museum. That's even worse. A lot of showcases of what used to be. But I feel God in this place this morning. I'm glad my faith's not based on feeling, but I'm glad I got a faith you can feel every now and then. Amen. If you could take what I feel in my soul right now, if you could take what I've got in my soul right now and put it in a bottle, you'd put Budweiser out of business in a day. Mark chapter number 12, verse 28, and one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. I want to preach this morning on this thought. Love God. Love God. Lord, help us, I pray. Lord, I feel so inadequate to try and preach this. When I started working on this message, I felt like a little kid. <clears throat> I was overwhelmed at the magnitude of the truth in this verse and in this statement and this commandment. But I pray, Lord, that you'd help us this morning to be able to maybe shed a little bit of light on what this means. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. If I were to ask you to stand up right where you're at, and bring you this microphone and ask you to tell everybody in here what does it mean to love God? What would you say? That phrase, it's, it's so cliche. Loving the Lord, love God. We hear it all the time. It's in songs. We hear it, people testify. We'll stand up and say, I love the Lord. If I were to ask you, what does that even mean? What would you say? Because that's where I started Thursday morning. What does it mean to love the Lord? What does it mean to love God? I'm amazed at the people that profess to love God seem to have no idea what it means. 
So what does it mean to love God? It's, I know this is more than having fond thoughts of God. It's more than favorable thoughts of God. It's more than just being comfortable around safe people. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to preach slow this morning so this thing can saturate and soak in. Listen to me now. It's, it's not talking about spiritual things. It does not mean you love God. Or you love good old gospel toe tapping music. That doesn't mean you love God. I had some kin folks back in the day when they'd get drunk, they'd go to singing gospel music, gather around a piano and sing hymns. Drunk as skunks. Watching some people insist that they love God's like a person saying how much they love drinking water while they're holding a chocolate milkshake. Watching some people, hearing some people talk about loving God's like a person trying to convince you how much they love driving a Chevrolet while they're pushing a Ford. Just kind of cock your head and go, I don't, I don't get it. It's like a person that swears up and down they're vegan and they're eating a meat lover's pizza while they're saying it. Something don't add up. One thing is clear to me, simply saying you love God cannot be the deciding factor of whether or not you love God. When it comes to loving God, our declaration does not supersede God's definition. Our confession doesn't override God's criteria. In other words, we can only say we love God when God says we love God. And here's, here's where we need to get this morning. We need to understand the importance of loving God. <clears throat> My, fight, my failures as a husband, my failures as a daddy, my failures as a Christian, my failures as a pastor can all be traced back to me loving God. Is everybody still with me? R.A. Torrey said, if loving God with all of our heart and soul and mind is the greatest commandment, then it follows that not loving Him that way is the greatest sin. If that ever sinks into your mind and heart, it'll convict you. If it don't, you need to reach over and check for a pulse. We live in a society today where people that are trying their best to love God with all of their heart and soul and mind and strength are laughed at, mocked, we're called radicals, we're called fanatics, we're called all kinds of names. Preacher, I think, I think you're overdoing it. How, you, I want you to explain to me how you can overdo loving God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. How do you overdo that? How, how you can't get any more extreme than that commandment. You say, well, if I, if I, if I really did that, it, it, would, it would change my whole life. You think? Of course it would. Of course it would. Look at our text, verse 30. They asked him, what is the first commandment? What's the first commandment? And God said, Jesus said, this is in red. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5. He didn't come up with this. He's just quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5, where God told the nation of Israel the same thing. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So what can we draw from this verse this morning? The word all is mentioned four times. All. 
thy heart, and all thy soul, and all thy mind, with all thy strength. Mentioned four times. Four is a number of the world or of creation. You see that number four? That's what it stands for, the world or creation. There are four directions, north, south, east, west. There's four elements. What am, I, what, am I, what am I to derive from this that our world, our very existence should revolve around our love for God? Now that makes, that makes good preaching and that makes pretty singing, but that makes hard living. Let me break it down for you. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm drawing from this verse this morning. Our love for God will affect every single relationship in our life. He talked about our heart. That's, that's, that's our relationship with God. That's upward. He talked about with all of our soul. That is outward, our relationship with others. Talked about our mind. That's inward. That's our relationship with ourself. That's secret life. Those secret conversations, those meditations that go on that nobody sees. And then our strength, we could say that would maybe that's downward. That's our external, our relationship with the world or with the earth. That's basically upward, inward, outward, and downward. It is all encompassing. Everything in our universe should revolve around our love for God. Our love for God defines us. Our level of love for God defines us. Is everybody still with me? I'm just going down through here. Our love for God determines every decision that we make. It influences every aspect of our lives. It influences and determines every ounce of energy that we expend, our love for God. If we love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, I'm still in the book. Our love for God will determine every friendship and every relationship that we foster. Our love for God will affect our thought life. God help us. Yeah. Saying you love God while you're thinking carnal worldly thoughts is like saying you love your wife while you're lusting after another man's wife. Yeah. It determines our dreams our hopes and our ambitions are all a product of our love for God. It determines what we do. It determines where we go. It determines who we are. And it determines who we will become. Loving God is the epitome of making Jesus the Lord of our life. Amen. Everything in mine and your life is a product or a byproduct of our love for God or the lack of it. Let me give you some biblical facts about loving God. According to 1 John 4, 19, our love for God, to whatever extent it might be, is a response to His love for us. 1 John 4, 19, we love Him because He first loved us. Someone said... The greatest reason to love God is God. Amen. Just chew on that one just a second. Now why he loved us, I do not know. 
When we were yet in our sins, Christ died for the ungodly. For a good man, the Bible says, scarcely for a good man, a righteous man would one die. Yea, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't understand it. I just don't understand why he would love us. But he loved us first. So whatever love we have for him this morning, to whatever extent it might be, it is a response to the fact that he initiated that love relationship with us. Whew. Greatest reason to love God is God. We see that in our text in verse number 32 of Mark 12. The scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God There is none other but he. Brother Shutt, we were blessed to hear Brother Bill Shutt, my preacher friend from up in York, Pennsylvania, came down and spoke at our couple's getaway, our romantic escape. He took us over there to 1 Corinthians where it talked about how the husband may please his wife, how the wife may please her husband. Took us back to the book of Genesis where God said to Adam, shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they two shall be one flesh. He talked about how that there was nobody else. There was nobody else. Adam, God said what man, what God put together, let not man put asunder. That's what God said. Is everybody still with me? It's quiet. That's okay. I just every now and then I say, y'all still with me. Make sure you're still with me. What God put together, let not man put asunder. There was nobody else. From the beginning, it was not so. He would not permit divorce from the beginning because there was nobody else. There was nobody else. Before Adam and Eve, there was, no, there was nobody else. Eve couldn't leave Adam and go for somebody else. There was nobody else. I'm drilling this home. Here's the problem with us today in our love relationship with God. We have not yet established the fact that there is nobody else besides God. That's why God had a problem with Israel. He called it whoredoms. He called it spiritual adultery. James said, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. That's an unfaithfulness to God. How many times did God say, I am the Lord and beside me there is none else. There is no other God Thou shalt have no other small g gods before me. The reason why we as Christians today are struggling in our love for God is we are looking over the fence at the other small g gods. That's why. And our love for God is because he first loved us. Number two, loving God is a choice. Now listen to me. Love is a choice, period. Yeah. Well, I fell in love. No. Love is a choice. And I'm going to prove it to you from the scriptures. In Titus chapter number two, Paul told Titus, in Titus two, to, for the aged women to teach the younger women to love their children and to love their husbands. Right. Teach them too. Not teach them how to fall in love, but teach them to love their children and to love their husbands. Ephesians chapter number five, husbands, he said, love your wives. He didn't say fall in love with her. He commanded husbands to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Our text this morning in Mark chapter number 12 and verse number 30, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. It was a commandment. 
which means it's a choice. Love is a choice. And if we love God, it's because we choose to. And if we don't love God, it's because we choose not to. Loving God is not an emotional or physical, uncontrollable action. Loving God is an exercise of our free will that we decide and we choose to love God. Not just to love him, but to what extent that we will love him. Some love God, but with reservation. They don't love him with all of their heart. They don't love him with all of their soul and with all of their mind and with all of their strength. It's a reserved reservation and that is a choice. We choose to love him and we choose to what extent we love him because we were commanded to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength which tells me that that is something that we can do. If you do love God, it's not by accident or by chance. You love God on purpose. Amen. Some Bible facts about loving God. Our love for God, to whatever extent it might be, is a response to his love. Number two, loving God's a choice. Number three, God knows if we love him or not. Right. 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 Now we might can tell people we love them and not love them. And they can believe that we love them and we don't love them, but God knows whether or not we really love him. In John chapter number 21, verse number 17, Jesus said to Simon Jonas, the son of Jonas, lovest thou me? The third time. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. You know, why are you asking me over and over and over if I love you? You know whether or not I love you. <clears throat> Jesus said in John 5, verse 42, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. You know what's sad is that there are Christians today trying to convince God they love him when he knows they don't. Number four, not only God knows if we love him or not, but others know if we love God or not. Right. You can't love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength, and people around you not know that. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 8, 3. The Bible says, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. After studying this message, <clears throat> Brother Tim, there's a lot of things that I want people to say at my funeral. And by the way, I want thousands of people at my funeral weeping and wailing and crying. <laughs> <clears throat> I want them sitting in sackcloth and ashes, pouring dust on their head. They walk by my open casket. I hope, oh God, it's open. You know what I want them to say when they look over in my casket, Brother Bill? I want them to look in my casket and say, he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> no, that ain't it. I can't think of anything greater Then for somebody to walk by my casket, look over at me, and turn around and look at the person beside him and say, that man right there loved God. Yeah. Now, I just can't think of anything greater. I can't, I don't want them talking about my books or my messages or my singing. I can't think of anything greater that could be said about somebody as they love God. Because if we love God, everything else would be all right. I mean, that, that ripple effect, Dr. Bittner, that trickle-down effect, if we get that right, we're in good shape. Yeah. I'm not preaching this morning about loving my church, and I've preached on that before. I'm not preaching this morning about loving your pastor. 
We just had the couples get away and we heard some messages about loving our wife and loving our husband. I'm talking this morning about loving God. And it has settled, it has settled down and deep inside of me to examine my degree of love for Him. Our love for God will be evident by our life. We will have a testimony that we love God or that we do not love God. People will know. Our life will speak louder than our lips. Not loving God is serious. Number four, not loving God, not loving the Lord Jesus Christ is a, is a bad problem. Let me tell you how serious it is. And this scares the daylight out of me to read this verse. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Anathema means a person or thing that is doomed to destruction, cursed, accursed, or we would say damned. That's what anathema means. Let him be accursed. Let him be damned to hell. And the word maranatha means the Lord is coming. Jesus is coming. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said, let him be anathema maranatha. Now, that's pretty strong preaching, y'all. That's strong preaching right there. Tell you something else. You can lie about loving God. You can lie to yourself and you can lie to other people about loving God. 1 John 4.20, if any man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. You can lie about loving God. Your life could reflect that you really do not love God, but with your mouth you can say that you do. Your love for God, number whatever X, next it is, your love for God can be diminished or it can be left. Revelation 2, 4, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Matthew 24, 12 says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Sad to see husbands and wives or love toward each other wax cold when they lose that first love. We had a good time up in Pennsylvania a couple of days. 21 couples, I think, made the trip. We had a good time. And people laugh. They snicker when you talk about being in love and romantic escapes and scooching and smooching. And they get uncomfortable and they start squirming. But to see husbands and wives be able to rekindle that passion and that love for each other. I told them, I told them yesterday, I said, I said, we spend money to maintain our cars. We spend money to maintain our houses. It's hard to find people that are willing to spend a little bit of money to maintain their marriage. Yeah, it costs money. It takes time and money. But I don't know about you, my marriage is worth it. Unplug and go focus on rekindling and re-sparking and cultivating that first love. Doing things together. But what's even more tragic to see husbands and wives drift apart and see their relationship grow cold to see people do that toward God. And it can happen. Your love for God can be diminished. It can wax cold. You can, you can leave it behind. Here's another one. Loving God requires attention. Joshua 23.11 Here's what Joshua said, Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. You cannot put your love life with God on autopilot. You've got you to heed it. 
You've got to watch it. You've got to cultivate it. You've got to protect it. You've got to guard it. You've got to work on that because it's a choice. It's a choice. After a while, if you're not careful, that thing will get away from you. How many of you have, how many of you have weeded your flower beds yet from the winter? How many of you need to? Look around. We're waiting for a dry Saturday, I know. I text the boys, I say, we gotta get them flower beds next week. We need to work on the flower beds. We gotta pull all the weeds and we gotta edge them, put down new mulch. They, 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 they kinda look bleh. It's cause we hadn't worked in them. We hadn't, we hadn't shown them any attention. We hadn't pulled those weeds. Boy, I love to walk up in my front yard and my grass is cut and everything's edged and the, and, the, and, the, and the flower beds are manicured and the bushes are trimmed. I can just stand there and look at my front yard. I love that. And when it's not like that, I just scoot right up the steps and I try not to look at it because I don't like it like that. But do you know your relationship with God's like that? You've got to cultivate it. You've got to pull those weeds and they'll spring up like that. Those weeds will spring up. Somehow or another, my mulch ends up all the way out yonder in the yard. How did my mulch get from the flower bed five feet over here in the grass? It's like, it's like something in the middle of the night's out there just kicking mulch up in my yard. I don't like that. I like to get the rake and get the mulch back in the flower beds and edge it and get everything nice and beautiful. And, it's a, and you have to do it all spring and all summer. And here's the problem. We just get tired of maintaining our relationship with God and the devil and the weeds start springing up and the world starts overflowing it. And next thing you know, our life looks like a lost person. People look at our life and they question whether or not we love God and they have every right to because we don't. Loving God is a relationship in the Bible that consists of very specific criteria. This morning with heads bowed and eyes closed with just the verses that we've looked at this morning, I wonder if there would be someone that would slip out of their seat. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I don't need to ask for a show of hands. Every one of us in here needed this message. Every single one of us in this building needed this message this morning but I wonder, would you get down here this morning and weed the flower beds? Would you get down here this morning and just maybe verbally, with your mouth, with your heart, would you maybe just tell the Lord you love Him? And maybe just do some soul searching and examine your life. And Have you been guilty of holding hands with the world, flirting with the world, cultivating a relationship with the world the whole time telling God, I love you, I love you, I love you. Altar's open. We're not in a hurry. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never been saved. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never been born again. If you died right now, you would not go to heaven. But you can, you could. It'd be our greatest honor this morning to take a Bible and show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Would there be somebody here this morning that would care enough about their soul, care enough about their relationship with God to say, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure if I die today, I'd go to heaven. I need your prayers. Would you slip your hand up so I can see it, so I can pray for you? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I see that hand. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands about the message because every one of us in here needed it. But I'm hoping this morning that maybe the, what God's been working in my heart and speaking to me about, God will let that maybe overflow a little bit this morning. Splash over on some of y'all. Loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul. 
letting it permeate and affect every area of our life. Because He's worthy. He's worthy of our unreserved love. If we could get that fixed this morning, it would fix a whole lot of other problems.